Citizen 12 is brought to you by Complexify, a social purpose corporation founded to support you living in alignment with your conscience and discerning what that is. Find out more at complexify.org. Complex I P H Y dot org. Hello, citizens. My name is Paige Halsey, and my name is Emily Bogan. This is episode 17 of the Citizen 12 podcast. Citizen 12 is not a program or a health treatment, but an inclusive place, common ground to share and learn. If you have not yet listened to episode zero, we invite you to do that. You'll get a good sense of what this show is about and hear our steps, which were inspired by Alcoholics Anonymous. And those can also be found through any of our sites. A little more of a preface this show, this content may stir stuff up for you. In some ways, that's part of the point. But also, we acknowledge that this can be hard, uncomfortable, even disruptive. Please engage with us responsibly and don't be on your own with stuff. Be in touch if that's the right thing. We care about you. It's why we're making the show. Our podcast is created in Seattle, Washington. We acknowledge this as Duwamish land and strive to honor the past, present, and future indigenous lives here. Citizen 12 supports Duwamish Tribal Services by paying real rent. Find out more at realrentduwamish.org. Today's episode is really, this time, all about lying. been telling you that we'd get into talking about lying in our most recent two episodes and that we haven't done that. Again, that has not at all been like intentionally withheld. It's just been the nature of the content. But now that we have begun to dig in on injurious behaviors and harm, which we didn't really realize needed so much fleshing out before talking about lying, but It seems like we're now ready to talk about lying. In today's show, in part one, we'll discuss different ways of lying, flavors of lying, if you like. In part two, we'll talk about frequently overlooked or even like minimized repercussions from lying. And then in part three, we'll talk about what it takes to live without lying. That sounds like a pretty bold uh, component, right? But maybe, yeah, some of what it takes to be a person who's striving to live without lying, yeah. right? I'm not trying to make it sound like... We don't lie at all ever. Right. Part one, ways of lying. First, seems most uh, obvious type of lying, uh, I we consider outright lies you know like where you say something that is not true Mm -hmm. I mean it almost seems silly to like have to give an example of that I think most of us I mean it seems like kind of a a, well it's even something we just get taught when we're really really little most of us you know you'll say oh I met an elephant last night and your mom will say well I I think that's a lie (laughs) you know like we get introduced to the concept of outright lying when we're little Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to confess that even as someone in a practice of like valuing honesty, and I would say really for a very long time that I have been intending to be as honest as possible, maybe not my whole life, not, you know, like as an adolescent, but uh, certainly by my late teens, I was you know, at least saying and attempting to be valuing honesty. And even with that in place, I remember I now look back on some blatant outright lies I still told even as somebody who valued honesty. And you shared not that long ago that, you you know, we still occasionally find ourselves just saying something that is not true 
Yes, I can report that in the last couple of weeks, there's been, an, in the last few months, there's been some instances for me. Okay. So I think that's probably all there needs to be said about outright lying. I think it's pretty clear not to not too nuanced. Right. Like I would hope we all know when it happens <laughs> and it becomes more and more clear when you say something that is not true. Like more and more clear as you've grown up or matured mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. matured in your spiritual practice. Yeah, because I don't want to just take advantage or not take advantage, but like um, I know that some people aren't able to distinguish and that that's a whole nother story, I think. And I think that this is, ep this is, this episode is, you know, we're not talking about like a patho pathological, pathological inability yeah, to, to not lie. Right. Yeah. We're going to talk about kind of a more middle ground difficulty with lying. The painful situation where you're like very aware. Part of me is tempted to just say like, how much is there even for us to say about outright lies? But it's also occurring to me that there is some like, right, like I don't, I don't find myself telling lies like I met an elephant last night, but I do find myself and observe other people say things like, oh no, it's fine. When my deep true sense is that something is not fine. And even you had recounted the occasion about somebody saying that they don't get offended I mean, it's it almost slips into the next category that we're going to talk about, lies of omission, because it's like omitting being disturbed, except that when we volunteer it, oh no, that's fine. Technically, that is an outright lie when something isn't fine. That's a good point. I didn't consider that. So there, it's a little more insidious than it might seem. Maybe. Maybe we... Maybe... I mean, I don't know what lies you were referring to when you said you have told some lies recently. Yeah. And we, you know, well, this, you know, we haven't said it. This can be really uncomfortable. Many of us feel bad. And, you know, I just talked about how we learn about lying early in life. A lot of us get shame all jumbled up with this, interferes with our ability to even assess our own being honest. And that untangling that to make space to do like healthy self-reflection is not a small thing. Mm -mm. Well, oh, did you have another point? Well, just um, the lies that I was referring to, I'm not ready to like put on the air just because <laughs> I actually haven't amended them yet. And okay. I don't want to like amend them on air without thank you letting you know it's i find that might be inconsiderate to whoever uh, it is agreed. right okay yes um <laughs> like oh thanks um so but yeah i would say that um a lot of the times for me when it comes up it's a never when i'm feeling particularly like safe or you know, secure, it's usually something that seems like an emergency situation or I perceive it to be an emergency situation. Like if I don't lie, X will happen. Um, so, and I think we're going to talk more about later, like how to live without lying. And I think we'll get into like, how do you avoid feeling as if you must lie in those types of situation. And I think we'll talk about that later, but yeah. Our next flavor of lying, like I just said, are lies of omission. So that was not a way of lying that I recall getting told about as a young child. I don't actually recall when I was introduced to the concept of lying by, om by omission. But for any of our listeners who aren't familiar with this, this would be withholding information that kind of by a reasonable assessment, someone would deem should have been set shared. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like a fair way of describing it? Mm -hmm. So let's say we're in a, in some kind of relationship, whether that's, an intimate friendship or even theoretically, you know, like a citizen and a neighbor or something, right? Like two neighbors. Citizens, not what I meant to say. I'm thinking about like even with a, a government official or something, you know, yeah, like somebody working at the Department of Licensing. Like there's some 
generally agreed upon standard expectation of transparency and honesty. And so to withhold reasonable information can kind of go over the line and cross into being a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and having the reason that it seemed important to kind of talk about this is that, well, having this fleshed out as a way of examining how honest we are has been useful to me, right? Like if I didn't even know that lying by omission could be a thing, I might actually find myself depending on that. And then they've got all the cascade of consequences of dishonesty and I might not even know why. So having omitted reasonable information to include really something that has been important to me and in my relationships and something I think it's easier to think of that we expect of other people. Right. That's a good way to like a good barometer. Right. Mm -hmm. So I might be able to rationalize why I'm not going to tell you something about myself, but if you, for whatever reason you thought was okay to withhold information from me, I'd be like, no, man, that's lying. Mm -hmm. Uh, This might seem kind of heavy, but actually STD stuff comes to mind with this, that withholding STD, STI, you know, status with somebody who you then, who I then have unprotected sex with, right? That has crossed the line of, oh, it's just something I chose not to tell you to, oh, maybe this is actually dishonest. Right. I think maybe in the next, in our follow-up episode, we might discuss the difference between privacy and lying by omission. Absolutely. I think we actually had planned to cover it under prudence. Great. But discernment, privacy, prudence, these are all things that are very easy to slip in and out of. What, way to, what How do I be prudent and honest? And of course, privacy is a valid uh, concern to, to measure what we share with people about. And for those of us, though, who are really striving to practice honesty, we have to kind of do some untangling sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, yeah. A lot of the time. Next up, we have what I think of as lies to myself. So this is probably the most complicated, difficult to catch when it's happening category, flavor of lying. But lies to myself, or also known as delusion, right? So when I say something to myself that isn't true and then I believe what I'm telling myself. Actually, no, it's fine is a good example because if you're like me, you say that to yourself, not infrequently. No, it's fine. And for myself, that is very much not always the truth. So for me, it has been a practice to start paying attention to what I'm saying to myself to check. Is that true? Before I just Mm -hmm. buy what I'm saying to myself. Right. First of all, what am I saying to myself? Right. Which, of course, does include having to even Mm -hmm. be awake enough to and interested enough to to be assessing Mm -hmm. what are these things I'm saying to myself? Like, what am I? What conclusions am I making about myself in this context? The last category I consider dishonest behavior almost like a form of lying. And, you know, this is just the whole point of these categories is really to add value, to make it easier to examine my behavior. It's not about, like, making sure something gets labeled as the right flavor of lying. And something like snooping is is a good example, I think, for this category. Mm -hmm. So, like... I think a lot of people would agree stealing, like that's a pretty easy to identify behavior that's dishonest that might, you know, may or may not feel like it's including lying. But something like snooping, you know, kind of like bumps into that lie by omission, you know. I mean, when I've snooped on people, I haven't told them, hey, you should know I'm a person who snoops or, you know, like it's a hidden, it's a hidden package of behavior. Right. I I think I have an example of I mean it doesn't like it's not like it needs one. I mean you can sure if you want to but you definitely don't have I I mean I'm I'm not happy to admit to our listeners that I have well maybe maybe it is useful for me to say 
I have had, uh, how to say that? I have done quite a lot of snooping in the past. Mm. I'm very, very grateful to be able to report that that appears to have subsided. My, my temptation to do it, the whole thing, I can't remember the last time. I mean, now my literal like reflex is to look away from private information Mm -hmm. but really it was it was not the distant past when I if you know if even if I could see over a a stranger's shoulder to read something on their phone my like temptation was to do it to read Mm -hmm. hidden things Mm -hmm. and it and really that reflex has changed for me like I I genuinely don't want to expose myself to material that is not for me I feel the same way actually I snooping was not a behavior I'm grateful to say I ever really felt compelled to do one thing I'm that's coming to mind is like presenting myself like I I think in the past someone said to me recently that I seem like a trust fundian whoa yeah Oh, like how you the way your that image, like your physical mm-hmm. image, and how you carry yourself? how you, how I carry myself, like my lifestyle. Wow! And I was like, shit, that made me think a lot. Like, no, not. In, I mean, I get you know, I've my parents have been supportive, and they're you know, somewhat financially stable, I suppose. But like, definitely, I don't have a trust fund, and I don't have a like flow of cash that I can that's expendable and that I can I can't afford to be frivolous right did you see something about how you have presented yeah yeah so um I think that just to be transparent I think that my so I I I did experience and I have experienced financial insecurity at certain parts of my life and I think that that insecure I had some insecurity around that and that I might have sort of built up a behavior that I wasn't so conscious of, right? To maybe try to like hide that, like that. That's an area that I felt insecure in, and that trying to seem that I had more under control or that was more con- in control in my life, so that you know people didn't worry, or you know, I would be presented as more valuable. Who know? You know, I think all of the above, but I think that that. It probably took on a life of its own. And I think it's also like kind of has a lot to do with just like mixed in with vanity and mixed in with, you know, wanting to appear like I have it all together. And yeah, and I think that all and like liking nice things and that kind of materialism and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I was like, wow, Um, I think personalities personalities like falsified personalities or that kind of thing personas even i like that word for um, it, persona personas can be like a like a pattern dishonest behavior and like wow i when he said that to me i thought you know <laughs> if that you know if you've if you've met me a handful of times and that's the impression that you have from like being with me like four times and like maybe seeing me on social media that like that's well, your interpretation, yes. Like, I have of to course. account for his own interpretation and his own projections. But, like, I I know in my heart that, like, it's my fear of economic insecurity, I think, and my desire to, like, appear like I have it all together that I think ultimately, like, is behind is shaping, that shaping some outcome. sort of persona. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that. That I think that sets us up really nicely for the show. And and that's incredible insight. I mean, I'm kind of impressed that he could say that and that you could hear it in a way that wasn't just like, screw you. <laughs> like, I think a lot of people. Who, it made me really sad when he said oh. that because I was like, fuck. Like, But I think that really speaks to your character that you, who you actually are, doesn't want to be seen as a trust fundian. No, but I think that maybe... In the like maybe at some time in the past, yes. that might have made me feel like good. Yes, but I think now that I deeply do want to be connected and I want to be known, I see like wow, I really didn't do myself a service here, yeah. and I have to like undo this mess. I'm so happy for you. I mean, Yay, it's a funny thing to celebrate. Stuff. More work to yeah. do, but really, that it also it really 
it pulls all these flavors of lying together, mm-hmm. right? So it doesn't you ha- you didn't kind of mention any outright lies there, but you can see how omitting Oh, and I want to clear this up. So you said there have been times where I where I've been financially insecure. And I I think what you actually mean is there have been periods in your life where you had difficulty getting your basic needs met because of money. There, like that there there were times where you mm-hmm. literally were not having a reliable source of money to get your needs met which I, ju- I it might seem silly to have to clarify this but that that's different than being disproportionately afraid of not having money right so there's a reality to the difficulty and damage of insta- legitimate life instability which may include inadequate money mm-hmm. you know we also call it poverty mm-hmm. and then there's the the realm of actually having adequate stability and security and still being torqued by mm-hmm. the fear of losing our security right. and that often i notice that these get collapsed in a way that's very disempowering mm. so i just and because it didn't seem like you were using super specific language i i know that's what you were saying mm-hmm. because i know your story well enough right. but i just wanted to pull that apart a little bit it for myself fell more into the realm of poverty than like fear yeah just unreasonable fear now of course right. you you what you were saying is that you actually think that because you have actually had poverty experienced being impoverished that you you were like uh more afraid of appearing poor mm-hmm. and that that and motivated you to cover that up mm-hmm. hide that omit mm-hmm. the reality of your financial situation yeah that was very clear mm-hmm. and seems really relatable and understandable mm-hmm. this leads us into our next topic part two hidden harms of lying the hidden damage or sometimes not so hidden but less talked about damage so you you had just said that you want to be known mm-hmm. and that seeing that you had mis portrayed yourself inaccurately portrayed yourself effectively with this person it left you seeing you had done yourself a disservice Mm -hmm. because he doesn't know who how you actually are okay so let's go back to my story from before i think it was the last episode i had talked about being afraid that i don't matter Mm -hmm. and then like reflex to that i be vain I think right. I had said I'd be self-centered, but I'd be self-centered and vain. Mm-hmm. And then the fallout of me being vain is lying, you know, to make myself look good, which is basically exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So here in this segment, we're going to add some of these potentially less obvious things about what doesn't work about this dynamic. And this, as with this whole show, is not comprehensive. I feel like we keep saying this, but none of the show can be comprehensive. So, no, we're not going to talk to you about all of the reasons that it's bad to lie. These are just some of the harmful consequences of lying that do seem frequently overlooked or minimized. And let's start with that a consequence of lying any of those flavors of lying is that we then have relationships with people where we aren't really known. Yeah. Unsurprisingly, this leaves us feeling feeling lonely and unknown. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, I don't know. Do you feel like you remember when you felt lonely and unknown and oh, you God, feel yeah. like you didn't know why? Hmm. Like it was compounded. Like, why do I spend time with people? Yeah. Why do I feel so lonely? Yeah, absolutely. Why am I still over here and they're all over there? Why am I not? Why is it exhausting? Like, why am I? Why do I feel like I've just put on a performance? Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I I suspect you couldn't articulate it quite that clearly when you were really in the heat of it. Because Mm -hmm. if you I think if you had said that to yourself in those words or out loud to another person you might have actually started to understand why you were feeling alone or lonely or Mm -hmm. unknown but for me it actually took a lot of time and work to come to terms with that part of why I was lonely 
was that I, I wasn't letting people know me. I didn't even know that that was really available. No. I, to I, act, just be myself? No. I think I didn't know it was available either. It was so much more like, no, this is who I'm packaging myself as because this seems like it's acceptable or People are worthy. supposed to be away. Cool, smart, fun, interesting. I don't, I'm thinking of the ways that I I th- was raised thinking people were supposed to mm-hmm. be. So the game is to hide all the ways I'm not like that and to inflate all the ways I am like that. Right. And I mean, really in my 20s, I feel like I thought that was actually who I was, was just this image that I was trying to be. Oh, yeah. And you get lost because then people start to... You know, that's who, that's, it's reflected back at you. Yeah. It's a lonely place. Yeah, painful. Well, and from the inside of it, I didn't see what the access to anything else might be. Mm -hmm. I think it would have seemed like news to me for somebody to say, part of what's going on here is that you're lying. One other thing, though, too, is that if you are in the practice of avoidance, which I have been hugely, Especially when it comes to something like having experienced poverty, you know, like you don't want to have to think about that stuff if you don't have a ready resolution for it. And it's nice to be in make-believe land. So, like, I think what I would do is appreciate all of my, you know, my persona that I had constructed being reflected back at me because then I could pretend and, like, sustain this make-believe self this make-believe life and I didn't have to address all the issues that I needed to yeah I I, I'm glad you added that the kind of lying we're talking about like what you just described like of course that's that's again seems so understandable and relatable Uh, somebody told me that I had come by my bad behaviors very honestly and that's what I hear there right Mm -hmm. like I don't hear that you were lying it's not like you were saying you know telling outright lies about your bank account that that you're admitting here anyway (laughs) um (laughs) you know but but that you came by this honestly right like it's so it's not because you're a bad person it's not like you sat down and decided right in order to win friends and influence people I'm going to pretend this lifestyle Mm -mm. and very reflexive reflexive Mm -hmm. and that's what so if you listen to the show you'll know i don't think that that means we're off the hook for having done it if it causes damage which we see that it has for us it's not the right thing and we got to knock it off as much as we possibly can like as soon as we can right and but that that it's not about that we are bad people it's not about that we are bad. No, but it's still grave. Like the when yes. I when, you know that was said to me literally last night, and it, you know, it's grave because it's like you're saying grave. It's grave. It's a yeah. grave issue for me because it shows me that like that's still alive. That dishonesty is like an active part of something of of me. I and really like, admire you owning that and especially you have said how hard it is to stay in a position of openness to be able to see where we are still doing this Mm -hmm. and you I these days I am and like I said kind of seeing more about where I'm pretending to be permissive Mm -hmm. as a form of dishonesty Mm -hmm. I I think it's really lovely it certainly makes me feel more endeared to you (laughs) right that you are engaged in this well and I've kind of said this on the show too before but like there are two ways to approach this we can lie and pretend we don't lie or we can be getting real about where we're still lying (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I think those are the only two actual options if I'm wrong and somebody's like no I definitely don't lie in any way shape or form at all Please hit us up. I'd be curious to know how you're executing that. Yeah, please. <laughs> I want to know. Skeptical. I I'm skeptical. I want to hear it. Do you actually think that that's a possibility? I mean, I guess maybe. Sure. Okay. I, yeah, I think that it's a possibility. Okay. And like, or if you find that you've come close to perfecting it or, yeah, I would love to hear about that. The next 
sort of hidden harm that I think it was harder for me to sort of come to terms with was how lying obviously not it it obviously warped my relationships with others like that's what you're describing with this trust fund thing mm-hmm. but less obvious to me was how it warped my relationship with myself my reputation with myself mm. and there are kind of two angles on that for me one is It, like, disrupted my ability to even know what was true about me. Mm -hmm. Just like you're saying, there's, like, a degree of pretending. Oh, yeah. I think that in my case, it blinded me and desensitized me in in my pretending to that I was avoiding addressing things that I could be responsible for. Beautifully said. You know, like, my own financial growth. Had has been stunted and like through your own pretending through that my it's own not pretend- a problem yeah, or something for sure and I still find myself making decisions as if I can be frivolous in this area or as if I can be indulgent in that other area and the truth of the matter is like you know the truth of the matter and finding finding ways that I've avoided growth and extended the life of financial problems So then there's also that we, when we're dishonest, when I have been dishonest, it's like I have to relate to myself as a liar Mm -hmm. or as that's who I am, Mm -hmm. which is disruptive in and of itself, especially as somebody who's attempting to practice honesty. Like it's, it like, it's stressful. You know, when I think of stress being like when friction, like physical stress, Mm -hmm. when two things are rubbing against each other causing friction Mm -hmm. also known as stress Mm -hmm. that's what I think of here like when Mm -hmm. I have two internal conflicting things like this I lied but I value honesty well there's rub there it's stressful and that has fallout right which many of us are familiar with the well and apparently might be kind of more accessible to some of us than others I don't remember like as a kid telling a lie and then getting a stomach ache because I felt sick about it or whatever. But I, but apparently for some people it kind of is more obvious. Mm-hmm. For me, I kind of had to at some point come to terms with that being – that lying leaves me anxious and stressed out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know actually scientifically we we like know this that it, it there's more of an, a mental and emotional load to con- carrying misinformation. Mm. So when we, it's part of how how they have worked on lie detection is to examine how much stress, stress people right. are under when they're telling right. lies. That makes a lot of sense. If we are responding to misinformation in our minds, like if we have we have this like for instance for me if I'm like. If I'm trust fund Emily in my mind, <laughs> like unbeknownst, but like you know, it's like adding. Then I'm pers- then I'm having to live that life simultaneously in a way, and you know, balance those things. Yes, I mean, even describing it seems hard, yeah, and tiring and costly, right? So actually doing it, which again, if if it hasn't been clear, yes, we are both people who very much value being honest and practicing honesty and not lying, and we still find that this is an area of operation that requires ongoing addressing. Mm-hmm. Of course, we'll talk about that in the third part. Next up with the hidden harms, and this is kind of even a little hard to articulate, but if I withhold from you I almost have to like build you up in my mind as incapable of hearing the truth about me right it's like you're stripping someone of their humanity whoa well that's a way clearer way of saying it yeah it's dehumanizing it's dehumanizing when I lie to you I have to undercut your greatness yeah and capability and autonomy as a person Yes, capacity to, to to love too, because I know that if when you know when I know if someone else is 
impoverished, for instance. I mean, I do philanthropic work for homeless women. You know what I mean? My heart is gaping wide open for people who struggle financially. And, but when it comes to me, like no one would ever, I wouldn't, I don't offer that same thing to other people, not being able to be honest about my struggles. And then it's almost like this false, I don't even, I I guess I'm struggling to feel like I'm articulating it very well, but you're like then saying to the people you're hiding it from, well, you can't handle Mm -mm. your, you must be, you're kind of a crappy person because I can't even tell you the truth. Right. And often that is a, that whole thing is a fallacy Mm -hmm. and is kind of like just a made up rationalization to excuse us and our lying. And why are you living in this world of zombies? That, yeah, like if somehow that was true, that the person I'm interacting with couldn't handle the truth, then I, pro- I, and we'll talk about this later, but I probably, it's not going to work for me to keep interacting here. Yeah. And if it, and if it's happening often, which is, I think, my case in the past, like if it's happening so often that you're, you know, that I'm not able to open up to people about who I really am, like what world am I living in? Well, I, who am I? Yes. Who, who, what how am I, doing, am I how where am I, am I putting human? myself? Yeah. Right. And, or am I misperceiving people? You know? Another good question. Is this me not actually accurately assessing what is acceptable welcome here? Mm-hmm. Or and I'm just and I'm just in a habit of never being myself. Right. And actually I don't I don't think I've talked about this before, but it used to be that it was so rare that I would be myself that it would be like a sea of me being my like pretend image that I thought was cool. And then like occasionally there'd be like a glimpse of feeling like I had really just been transparent and been myself. Mm -hmm. Now in my life, and I'm going to say, I do feel like this really did start to shift when I, around when I turned 30. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I'm going to also add that I, it does seem frequently to relate to some age development stuff it does seem like the people I interact with in their 20s are still more interested in constructing who they are going to be and then like trying to pretend that they are that construction and this was true for me too and then it's in the 30s for a bunch of different reasons in our 30s that we were like oh shit i i want to be myself like there is some reality to who i am and i that's actually who i want to get being let's get back in touch with that before i die or like you know (laughs) but like let's get back in touch with that before i like it's just evaporate into nothingness yeah so so now it's actually very rare that i put myself or be around be in environments where it isn't really where who I really am isn't really welcome and which has been so great because now I can use it kind of like as a barometer if I go somewhere now where I notice the that like urge to front or fake or to like withhold who I really am to me that's like an alarm now Uh uh-oh uh-oh this isn't a good place for Paige. This isn't a place where I fit. And that happens for all kinds of reasons. Mm. And I don't, I personally don't think I, who I actually am mm. is supposed to be a perfect fit everywhere in the world, right? Like there's a, in my book, it's totally appropriate to have like pri- public mm-hmm. spaces as distinct from private spaces mm, wow. and professional relationships as opposed to intimate relationships. I wonder if you'll get a kick out of this. It actually occurred to me recently that it might actually be more appropriate for me to go by Mrs. Halsey with people who I'm not intimate friends with. Mm. And that even <laughs> just, you know, I mean, and that would be very peculiar, right? Like <laughs> our culture and community, we really aren't doing that these days. Mm. But that there is almost like a degree of dishonesty when we like pretend Oh, well, we're friends. We, I know somebody just said it to you not that long ago. Well, we're, we've been friends. And you were like, well, I, I, no, I don't think so. No. We've been acquaintances. What I know of friendship. What I know of friendship, this isn't actually no, what we've been doing. No. And, and 
this isn't about like being weird or or being exclusive or difficult or difficult but it's like restoring accuracy mm -hmm. so so now when i find myself in in relationships you know i'm i'm trying to think of the occasions well yeah, there. I I went to a party. I actually went to a couple of parties recently where I noticed it didn't seem particularly welcome for me to just be my mm -hmm. my totally normal, comfortable self. And when I'm like, well, we record this podcast from my home. Mm -hmm. When I'm in my home with someone like Emily, who I do know quite intimately, you get a very different page appropriately so right but i'm like a much better person here from my home mm -hmm. with emily than i am you know at a at a party for example right and you've said to me that people have given you the feedback that they feel like they've been getting to know me via this podcast yeah yeah, yeah absolutely well we are certainly here doing this show striving to be our totally be ourselves mm -hmm. however we actually are mm -hmm. not pretend something about how we are mm -hmm. i feel like i got a little off topic but party well yeah that i was that i it just didn't seem like i mean to put it in ex an extreme way it's almost like it didn't feel safe to be myself mm -hmm. but in it wasn't really that it wasn't safe go ahead can we talk next time about the difference between knowing when to just kind of formalize ourselves a little bit or be prudent about the you know the parts of ourselves that we bring forth in certain public spaces and then also distinguishing that from places that we should not be entering that we that we don't Yeah, that's that's a really good. That's great. Yes, absolutely. On the list. Okay. Because I think it's helpful to think about it in terms of structure because something you said earlier made me think a lot about when you were talking about is this a place I should even be, a relationship should I, I should even be in. It made me think a lot about like accessibility and structure and um, like in terms of just kind of seeing things more of, as like structures and like the spaces that I bring myself and – and I'm talking about relationships. I'm not talking about actual physical places. And how sometimes really perhaps I'm, I don't belong. And yeah, that, and that the clues can be hard to read. Yeah, but that maybe, you know, when you, it's a great barometer if, if you do notice yourself starting to lie or like perhaps your persona your, is a little bit like an older persona that you used to rely on is coming forward again, like maybe that's a good indicator. Totally. Yeah, we'll definitely talk more about that. Did I cut you off? I don't remember. I think we're fine. Okay. Are you sure? Or are you just saying that? <laughs> good questioning. Although I would invite you to not take on being responsible for me <laughs> lying like that. <laughs> Let me check. Is it really fine? Yes, it's. it really is okay. fine. <laughs> So so the kind of wrap up about part two is that none of this junk that arises through lying result has resulted for me in anything like real relatedness or intimacy or connection, which, you know, whether I'm telling the truth to myself about it or not is usually what I actually am really seeking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk about being coming in your 30s and really realizing how badly you need that yeah how much that that's what we've, we've actually been wanted. trying to get to yeah yeah hmm. before we come back to talk about what it takes to live without depending on lying we are pausing here to thank and acknowledge our listener supporters thank you to listener a gari i i don't know how to say that a g a r I, I, <laughs> who recently wrote us a lovely and complimentative five-star review on iTunes. Thank you to each of our Patreon patrons who have early access to each show. It looks to us as though our community could really use this content and we are excited to create and share it. And this is a 100% listener supported show. So if you want us to keep it up, and if you already like what you're hearing, or even if you don't, but you think what we're up to is good, 
Or even if you just really want that early access, please become a Patreon patron at patreon.com slash c12pod. That's C12POD. All of our listeners are invited to support us by subscribing, rating the show, and writing us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Part three, what it takes to live without lying. One of the first things to say on top of what we've already kind of alluded to is that there are a couple of steps in the sequence of these 12 steps that I think are extra critical to have at play and in place before we are trying to address lying. Namely, in my view, the first step where we really kind of reconcile with that managing as an approach to living life is, is has a has a lim, is like lim, of limited effect and then the third step where we actually are doing what it takes to surrender to what we trust to guide us i mean for me that's really like as opposed to me managing mhm right so first step first third step before this work and i yeah the connection here is that i'm hearing and it's becoming very clear is the managing is sort of that breeding ground for the lying i would actually even say more clearly i don't see how lying is anything but a method of managing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i think uh, to me, that's actually quite yeah, plain. Lying is managing. Lying yeah. is managing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When would I have to be lying unless I'm attempting to manage something? Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm already on this track of, I mean, they're, they don't go together, right? If I'm saying I'm not going to depend on managing as a way of navigating my life and I'm going to surrender to what I trust to guide me, as our listeners know, like for me, conscience then I'm not, I'm like explicitly saying I'm not giving my life to dishonesty or my image of what I think I should look like. Mm -hmm. That would be managing. Right. Mm -hmm. I know we've said this in the last couple of episodes, but I, I want to reiterate here too, that there does seem to be a reality to that I have only had access to the degree of honesty that I have actually had access to. So we've said it throughout the sh whole show, but I've had this commitment to being honest for decades, yet here I find myself still with what seems like increasing access and practice in being honest. And I really see that there are steps that we can take, which is what this section is about, to expand our access to more honesty. And I really, I guess that's important for me to say, that's how I see it being possible to live without lying, is more like expanding my access to being honest than to like removing the possibility of being dishonest. Mm. Yeah, that resonates with me. Even now in the way that we're talking about it, I think you can see it's reflected that it's a we are currently finding ways to have more access to living that way. This giving up managing as a, you know, a, a way of operating, for me, it really goes hand in hand with what we've talked about so many times that I advocate for being lightly attached, or I should say what I strive for, for myself, being lightly attached. And definitely part of not lying for me includes increasing my comfort with being lightly attached, right? Like if you're super stuck on having to appear financially stable, mm -hmm. obviously that's going to make it harder to like tell the truth about where that's not the case. Oh yeah. Like, and that's exactly what I think had happened as I was very attached, almost feeling like I it was a necessity to appear that way. Oh yeah, you said that. Emergency you talked mm -hmm. about being Emergency. kind of animated yeah. where it was like you have to lie. Mm -hmm. Now, if any of our listeners are like concerned that if you move toward being lightly attached, that it might mean 
that you won't produce outcomes. And I'm saying this kind of hypothetically, but I have had people kind of say to me, well, but how is it, how is my life ever going to come together? Like, how am I ever going to, you know, make life happen if I'm taking this approach? My sense is it's like, yeah, we might not. And actually the evidence in my life is, yeah, I might not produce the outcome that I was attached to, like trying to make you think I'm a better person than I am or cooler than I am or smarter than I am. But if my life can be an example, there have then been outcomes that are actually have been truly, deeply beautiful and profound Mm. and, you know, wonderful, much more complex than I, like my personality or persona or identity was going to come up with. Mm -hmm. Lately, I've been talking with this, talking about this with people in terms of like my design, like my persona's design skill set is on par with like having crayons. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm going to be cool with my crayons. You know, like the degree to which I can kind of envision a good life for me is like, shallow it's Mm. it's it's crayon quality Mm -hmm. and then you know as a like a in this story god has like adobe illustrator so like Paige has crayons to make a good life with and surrendering to what i trust means having access to like adobe illustrator Mm. so yeah i might not execute the crayon drawing if i'm overly attached to my way but surrendering has included a rich, full life. That's been the reality mm. for me. I think that's really well said. Okay, another analogy. I hope it's. I hope you can hang with me. You can pause the show if it's too much visualization for you. But I think I'm including this because I, I think it has been useful to people. And I usually talk about this when I talk about injurious behaviors or even character defects. Many people have thought and talked about character defects in terms of them being removed, right? In the Alcoholics Anonymous seventh step, we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. My personal experience with this area of spiritual work has looked much more like what the Citizen 12 step is about, which is doing what it takes to live without injurious behaviors. And the picture that I have for this is like gas pedals in a car (laughs) and like gas tanks. So let's use lying as an example. Let's say I have like a pedal that I can depress. And when I press on that pedal, it's me lying. Well, I have depended on that fuel to get me through lots of situations to affect the image I wanted to have, all kinds of things, right? In the past, like I really, I, I was quick to press on that pedal. And to some extent, I still find myself even inadvertently putting my foot on the dishonesty pedal. I haven't found that there's been a time where access to that pedal has been removed, right? Like I wouldn't be able, like I don't even know how that would be possible. If I can talk, I can lie, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd have to like, I mean, if I can communicate, I can be dishonest. So I think of it more like, what is there to do so that my foot isn't hanging out, hovering right (laughs) above the lying pedal Mm. all the freaking time? I love that. Okay. Because I think that uh, maybe people can relate to me. Like, at least for me, that's how it feels. Like, I'm dangerously too close to the scats pedal sometimes, (laughs) you know? Like... Uh, and it's funny because I'm a new driver and sometimes oh, yeah. I get the pedals mixed up. <laughs> I know. No, you, do you? Is that Dude, true? Um, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not while I'm driving, but like <laughs> when I'm. Um, it's not funny. It's not. <laughs> but like when I'm um, parking and, and I'm having to kind of like go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, okay. back and forth. Um, <laughs> they can help you with some parking lessons so you're not having to go back and forth that many times. Um, but I'm getting there. Okay. I'm learning. Okay. I have a very hard parking spot to get into. Oh, that's and true. the yes, new I scratches on my car will okay. show you um, some proof of that. But anywho, point is that feeling, and I think it's 
being I mean, poised. I, yeah, like I'm I'm too close to this, and I and it's like it's it feels it feels tough to remove yourself from it, and also at the same time like r- realizing how accessible it is, and yeah, like the proximity and the and the reliance on it, and the, like the the desire to like move away from it and i just i really love that you said that oh good i'm yeah. glad well and it really speaks to the the i mean some bozo could say here's how you be honest you just be honest like stop lying well i it has it was never that simple for me and it's why this whole segment is about the things that i can do to make it less likely that i'm going to find myself lying right might less likely to depress that pedal mm. Which leads into our next point, which is that I'm responsible to the extent that's possible to not continue to put myself in dynamics, environments, and relationships where I like almost have to use that dishonesty pedal Mm -hmm. for me. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying if you're in a, you listener are in an environment where you have to lie, that that's wrong. I don't, I can't, I couldn't possibly know what the life, your life circumstances are. Mm-hmm. So far for me, I have continued to be shown that it doesn't work for me. Like I can't afford, like my peace of my, like my health can't afford for me to pay the price of persistently depending on dishonesty as mm-hmm. a way to get through. I think that this one has been a newer one for me and has been probably the most empowering, actually, because I've done, we and we go down this sort of like checklist and I can see that I've done these other ones and the ones that we're going to talk about, but this is the one that I think I was missing and where I'm most empowered because I have, I have such a big choice here. And it, at the same time, it doesn't put it all on me either. You know, it's like recognizing when, the environment is not healthy for me. And I've seen a lot of change since I've been interacting with sort of this this one here. We had said earlier about, you know, doing that discerning of, you know, for me now I use it as an alarm if I'm in an environment, in an environment where I get the sense that it's not like a good idea. It's not particularly welcome for me to totally be myself. There's also the reality that some environments very much do not want us to be ourselves. Mm. I, a cup, One thing really comes to mind is that there are places where it is illegal and not safe to be queer. Like that is a, that is just a cold, hard reality. Mm-hmm. And that's like a legitimate valid thing and i am queer and it is costly for me to like hide omit or suppress that and this is just one example and i know again this can be kind of a loaded thing for people but in this aspect it is the, and and i of course not everybody does have the privilege to uh, remove themselves from environments where it's not safe to be themselves. But for me, where I do have access to refraining from being in relationships and dynamics and environments where part of who I am is not okay, I want to take those steps. I want right. to I want to I want to accommodate that as much as possible. And this might kind of bring up Oh yeah, like at least for me, like sometimes I I don't feel moved to press that gas pedal. You know, of course, there's parts of my life where I feel pretty secure in my honesty with myself and other people, and I allow people to know me, and that's growing more and more these days. And so I like this one, too, because it kind of, it shows, you know, it shows that it's not like, it's not who you are. It's not who I am necessarily, right? So it's an interplay. Right. Excuse me. There's an interplay between how I operate and my environment and circumstances mm-hmm. and everything mm-hmm. yeah switching gears a little bit another element that we have observed for ourselves and in others that seems to contribute to being able to live without lying or depending on lying as much is to be actively engaged in sort of treating these underlying fears 
these underlying disproportionate outsized or self-centered fears that we have walked around with. In that example, we've talked quite a bit about vanity and making ourselves look good. So my experience is if I'm effectively treating my fear of not being good enough, Mm -hmm. then it kind of takes the steam out of the whole cycle, Mm -hmm. right? If I'm not as afraid, I'm not as like shoved into being vain and then I'm not shoved into lying to compensate for being afraid. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it's like another access to reducing the need for dependence Mm -hmm. online is to reduce problematic fear. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done. I understand. We haven't really talked about fear treatment in the show, I don't think. So that might be a topic we talk about at some point. Because I think it's, maybe for me, it's been a little easier to identify. I fear that I'm not being good, that I'm not good enough, but the treatment of it, I think, has been a little more difficult. Okay. Similarly, treating those habitual reactions to our fears, you know, even though, hmm, my sense for myself is that really, like, I have just had a tremendous amount of relief from a lot of those fears, of course, that's not to say that somehow, sometimes something comes up that like hits that nerve again. So another thing that has helped me is to examine and kind of untangle a lot of the reflect reflexive ways that I have been in response to fear. I was just talking to a friend the other day where we identified they get stressed out and their immediate reaction is to be angry. It's just like how it's gotten in there for them. That's not my reflex and it's it's a bummer for them and it 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 was it was a helpful clue for them to see just kind of how much of a reflex it is. Trying to make myself seem okay, trying to make myself look good has definitely been like a reflex a reflex to being afraid for me. Mm-hmm. So even knowing that about myself has helped me take the foot off away from that pedal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then of course a prerequisite to all of this is just being present, being awake and engaged enough in what I'm saying and what you're saying and how I'm talking to myself to even be scanning or tuned in to that I have said something that was or wasn't true or portrayed myself in some way that was or wasn't accurate. And then also, as you kind of showed that you have for yourself is this openness to self-reflection including receiving feedback from other people right these were things i did not always have or was not always interested in i think no. there was a time when you were saying you had if you had had that input about seeming like a trust fundy and that you might have felt complimented right complimented or even like okay so like it's almost like if you're really trying to achieve an end, it's almost like, oh, I've created like a, a fraudulent currency almost. And if, and if it's being validated by others, it's like, you know, a fake $20 bill that's not, that's gone undetected by the so cash, it's like a win. The cashier. Like you got away with something. Yeah. And now it's not seeming that way. Which no. I think to me is, I mean, it really speaks to that you have developed a genuine interest Mm -hmm. Which, again, is a prerequisite. Without a genuine interest in your own peace of mind, in true intimate connections, why would you be incentivized to practice honesty? I don't know. I don't think it's just because we're like good people. For me, I really, it's that it, it, it ultimately has been more interesting, exciting, and good, and like enjoyable to to continue to grow in this practice of honesty. Yeah, and it's also kind of, well, one, it's painful to be in relationships that there doesn't exist connection. It becomes more and more cl- like clear and empty. And then, two, the like, thought of sort of like being myself and seeing what happens and like where I'm taken and what sort of access I do get in this life to... Where that brings me is like, that sounds really exciting. Yeah, 
I mean, yeah. like, just to be you know, honest, you Absolutely. know, like a life that you designed with the crayons, you're telling me that's something kind of boring and you might want the illustrator version. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Same. <laughs> so two more little pieces that I see that have been useful to us have supported us in keeping our feet away from the lying pedals. Not being on my own with stuff is a primary one. And I see this element as part of the principle of the fifth step for me the practice like the ongoing practice of the fifth step includes having other people in on how I'm living like having my story known not just by me but by other people I trust who also have permission to like interrupt <laughs> or question and I personally I have you know, a few people who, a small group of people, I work pretty hard to keep them informed about what's going on with me and how I'm living, in part because through our old friend rationalization, I can like get confused and not be able to see where I'm lying to myself about something. And I absolutely trust other people around me to help me be seeing if I'm being dishonest is a huge asset for me. Yeah. I, I don't think it's possible for me to do this without a lot of other people's help. Same. It's, and yeah. And it's no small thing. Like it takes, it has taken a lot of mm, practice and experimentation and then also like keeping it keeping reminding myself of the value of it because it's time consuming and can be hard to like expose myself to make sure people can see into my life enough mm -hmm. but I'm really committed to it I really don't want to be left alone with my weird crap yeah <laughs> me either like please help me not yeah. be on my own doing weird crap and it and it does help to have people who, you know, understand where you're coming of from course. and like understand those fears and understand those, you know, the reasoning behind these, these behaviors. Of course. So that, you, you know, it doesn't fall on like there's without context. Right. Or, yeah. And there's no punishing that happens or anything like that. Yeah. But, oh the yeah. The right people. The but right people. This is like. Critical. Critical. Yeah. Lastly, we have that. Being in a practice of amending where we have done the wrong thing or acted erroneously or caused damage, made a mistake. Being in a spiritual practice of all that it takes to be amending those things, I see has really contributed to my ability to practice honesty. It's like in, has maintained like the incentive for being honest. And it's also helped me understand the effects of not being honest and recover from those mistakes mm -hmm. and what else well we talked about dehumanizing another person so this kind of gives them the opportunity to have their humanity back right because which of course returns our humanity mm -hmm. too right? right so this restoration of reputation for both parts makes it like keeps adding to the space for being honest mm -hmm. definitely when i have told the truth on myself after having been dishonest, there's then that much more space for me to be my real self. Right. Right. A lot of this is just like having reference points or like available options. Like if we're so set in our ways, we're going to, we're not going to have a lot of other ideas available to us. But once we start like putting the stuff into practice and working with it, I think new different ways of being become more available. That's my, that much is my experience. Mm -hmm. We usually conclude our show by saying that we'll undoubtedly come back to these topics again. Here I am adding a little note about that. There is a fluidity and an openness to a conversation like this show that I find invaluable and empowering and encouraging. I'm a fine writer and I love reading, but there's something about locking content and the thinking behind the content into text or print that adds like a finality in a way that kind of rubs me the wrong way. In my view, that's particularly constraining with the kind of material we discuss in Citizen 12. 
as we've continued to say, we intend to just keep adding to this ongoing conversation and making space for this kind of unfolding relationship to thinking and the experience of life. Space to make, like you were just saying, course corrections and to grow. I really like that. Good. Okay, that is all for now. Thank you for joining us. This show isn't a thing without you. Please do find us online. Chime in and write to us. We are listening for how best to serve. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all at C12pod. That's C12pod. We're also up at C12pod.com. Our thanks to each of you who contribute to this work. Thank you. 